Hey, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us today. Um, second uh, very interesting talk in our series uh, that we organized uh, with the IDC, uh, a series on science, design and art, uh, where we are looking into how both science with its in-depth knowledge and um, art, which is uh, the part of you know, our culture that looks very critically uh, into solutions, try to push boundaries, and how you, by combining science and art, how you could really come up with wonderful new uh, designs. And uh, today we have with us uh, Richard Hassel. Um, and those of you who are in architecture, I'm sure they have heard his name um, many, many times. Richard is a co-founder of BOHA, and BOHA, I had to look that up, that's actually um, the, the combination of the first two uh, characters of the last names of the two co-founders, being Wong Moon Sung, and that's the W-O, and the HA is of H-A is, of course, of Richard. Um, that company was already established in 1994 here in, in Singapore. So I think he's probably as much Singaporean as he is Australian, where he comes from. Uh, he studied um, at the uh, University of Western Australia and then uh, got his Master of Architecture from the uh, RMIT University in Melbourne, or the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology. Uh, it's the abbreviation of that. Um, and his company is very well known uh, for buildings uh, here throughout uh, Southeast Asia, China, Australia, uh, whether it's residential towers, public housing estates, mass transit stations, hotels, cultural institutes, so wide range. And I think it's probably most well known because they try to incorporate sustainable design uh, into their buildings. You see, um, behind Richard already a lot of green, and that is what his buildings or their buildings are well known for. And uh, I think that's also why we uh, wanted to, uh, to invite him here uh, to just tell us a bit more on how you get all this background, all this science, and uh, such beautiful things and the whole design of it, because they are mecha projects. I mean, they are not the straightforward projects. And um, I'm sure Richard will show you some of the wonderful buildings, um, but the buildings I, I think stand out, at least for me as a non-architect here in Singapore, uh, are of course Oasia Hotel. You remember in the center, you know, in the center this building that has this sort of, what's it, a rusty color? I <laughs> know it's not rust, but you know, uh, full of plants, uh, as well as the, uh, the Hotel Royal, uh, which is also at Pickering, uh, which is full of plants. So, so I'm not going to uh, say anything more. Uh, Richard, uh, I'd like to invite you. For everyone, please, um, um, you know, mute uh, your, uh, your, your phones. Uh, if you don't do it, we will. Um, and you can use that uh, for your questions. Um, and uh, you can ask questions also in between and at the end I will lead a discussion uh, with Richard so I hope we get lots of questions of you. So Richard, uh, the floor is... Thank you very much, uh, Lucien. Um, yeah, this was a fun topic for me because um, uh, it's sort of a chance to um, uh, share some of the more um, the, the things I'm interested in for fun, which eventually turn up in the work, I think. Um, and so I wanted to share a little bit about all these fields around architecture that, uh, that we explore. And um, at the end, just show a little bit about how the thinking translates into um, another field and, and we, we make use of it. Now I'll just get my mouse working. Yep. So the first one I called the cabinet of curiosities because I think um, it's a really important mindset to have this a little bit of a magpie mind uh, where anything that grabs your attention, you you um, you follow it rather than saying, "Oh, that's not my core interest or activity." 
Um, and a cabinet of curiosities was a, a kind of um, display that gentlemen in the era of enlightenment would, would, would gather. So it might include a whole lot of uh, interesting things. And this was actually a slide I put together on, on, a, on a carpet range that we designed, but I sort of put together um, this thing just to show all the various influences in terms of what was informing our carpet design. Um, and so I'll go through a little bit and just show different aspects. Um, first thing is sort of in my count of curiosities, I, I thought it was something natural and human, but I think a lot of it is learned behavior. So this is me with my mum and my dad <laughs> at an art exhibition that I put on. Um, but as I've got older, I've realized I actually had quite a lucky childhood in that my parents are both very curious people. Uh, our house was full of books. Um, my mum's father particularly was, uh, he was a doctor, but he was so interested. So we inherited a huge library on politics and science and uh, philosophy and, and classics. And so, um, you know, it was sort of growing up in a, in a library almost. Uh, then my dad's a keen geologist and botanist and he has so many collections of things. So as, as a kid, we were sort of, my whole, you know, me and my brother and my sister, we were all encouraged to make collections of things, um, catalog them, uh, look them up in books. You know, if you saw a bird outside the window, you expected to know what it was and what its scientific name was. And so I think um, it's sort of really privileged to be in that environment. And I think for um, people who are not brought up in that environment, it's actually something you have to consciously adopt, I think, to, to get the really broad knowledge base that is good for informing uh, design particularly, which is a, a sort of cross-disciplinary uh, activity. This slide is actually from my dad's, he did a second PhD on paleobotany, just for fun, <laughs> at the age of, um, of like 60. Um, and, uh, but he was looking at pollen and, but what was something very strange was when I finally saw his thesis, um, the shapes and, and um, geometric objects in it were closely approximating a sort of art project that I had. So I thought there was a nice serendipity or connection uh, between generations and uh, across fields. So these are just like things that are really interesting. You know, this is a, a, a plant from a place where we always go on holidays. Um, a hakea, but just extraordinary flower that really looks like maybe like a coronavirus. This is a common plant in Singapore, but it has a really interesting fractal form. Uh, in the way it uh, organizes its leaves. Um, this is, I like fish in aquariums. And so the, you know, this pattern, you start wondering where it comes from and then find out that it's a um, reaction diffusion kind of mechanism in the cells that create this, this pattern. Um, you know, sh the mathematics of shells are really interesting. So this is a shell from, uh, I collected what I was about, um, uh, eight years old, and I, I discovered they were still at home in the cupboard. Uh, same with this, uh, a coral. And so I think this sort of uh, grabbing of stuff that inspires you, even if you're not sure why, it can be very useful. This is a, a Kuba textile, which is an African tribe. So it's a, a woven raffia, uh, but really interesting in terms of um, uh, pattern making, repetition, difference, the way it's kind of organized, but it's not, and it transforms. Uh, as an architect, that's something very interesting for me because it's, it's not boring, but it's not, you know, random or chaotic either. Uh, this is a, um, an artwork. I, I love tribal art. I find it very powerful, but what's really interesting is the eye here is actually a shell, uh, the, the little cap of a mollusk, uh, but it, it just, this little piece of a shell, you know, transforms the whole mask into this quite terrifying, alive looking eye. Um, this is another piece of tribal art, um, a New Guinea shield. And what I really like about it is it's sort of this perfectly ambiguous 
figure, like I don't know if I'm looking at a face or a fish um, or, you know, many different things that seems to shift. And so this, this um, uh, ambiguity is also something very interesting to me. Uh, these are beautiful drawings from a, a scientist who was, uh, um, well, he was actually a, a, an optic uh, surgeon uh, and made these really beautiful drawings of, of the um, blood vessels and nerves in eyes. This is uh, from Ernst Teckel, who's a, another weird character. Um, so he was a a biologist and a scientist, but he was a fantastic artist and he create, he wrote this book called Art Forms in Nature. Um, and it just crosses boundaries and it's so interesting because of that. And in fact, the book triggered the, the design movement, the Art Nouveau movement, um, because it had such compelling um, pictures of nature that people just uh, embraced them in their, in their design. Um, and in fact, his, his pictures are really strange because they're, they're sort of scientific, but they're also very artistic. And in many cases, he took artistic license to um, you know, make the, um, the natural forms more architectural. And that then triggered architects and designers to bring them into it. So it's a, there's a whole lot of very strange connections and dialogues you get in the cultural sphere, which are in some ways, I think a little bit like QAnon conspiracy theories. <laughs> you know, it's sort of, in many ways, making spurious connections, but the strange thing is the connections become culturally meaningful, even if they're, um, you know, just based on, uh, uh, in some ways, a superficial similarity. Uh, these are, I love taking pictures out of aeroplanes. So this is when I fly down to Perth. Um, this is some of the farming country uh, that you cross over and the, all those dots in the top are, uh, salt lakes. Uh, this was flying over over China. Uh, just a really interesting um, uh, vision of urbanism that looks very much like um, some Paul Klee paintings. And so in my own house, I keep like I I buy things, I find things, I put them together um, just because I find they're um, proximity and the dialogue between them sort of stimulate creative ideas. Uh, and then I, I do run this parallel art practice, um, which for me is a really interesting relief because when I deal with clients, I have to justify everything 20 ways, you know, in terms of budget or um, uh, function or uh, um, economics or marketing or narrative and just being out of like uh, research something for the fun of it uh, I find very relaxing and not having to answer to anyone um, and but the strange thing is the more I've done it the more it's converged with my design work um, and now um, you know it's actually um, becoming quite seamless with with my work so I thought I'd just show a little bit about how um, art informs some of our work. Uh, and in this case, um, I'm showing works that are not my own art, but sort of art from famous art, basically, from the, from the canon of art. Um, and I think these are also interesting because these are works where often many people are aware of them. So they're a cultural reference that, that you can draw upon. Uh, so for instance, this is Relativity by, by MC Escher. Um, and a really interesting kind of playing with the rules of perspective and showing us how they um, can be uh, manipulated and transformed to create something very strange. Uh, this is a staircase in a house we did many years ago now. I think this is about 1997 or something, so quite a long time. Uh, but the houses had this staircase over a swimming pool, and so we thought it was quite interesting to make a very abstract abstract staircase. Uh, and so in a way, it's a staircase that reminds you of the Escher staircase in many ways. What I don't have a good photograph of it, this stair is also reflected in the swimming pool. So it, it's, it also appears virtually and upside down. So you do literally get people the right way up walking on the staircase and, uh, and reflected upside down. This is another uh, 
I, so this is a, a painting by Paul Clay. Um, it was really interesting. I thought that it sort of took a chessboard and then it added in um, gray squares onto the chessboard. Uh, so it's a really interesting piece of art because it makes you wonder maybe what kind of game you would play on this chessboard. Uh, but for me, it also reminded me of um, figure ground drawings that we use in architecture. So often you will draw the city, you know, the buildings are black, the public space is white. Uh, and then, um, but in tropical architecture, we're always talking about in-between spaces. So it, it sort of triggered this thought to me about um, how traditionally it's indoor and outdoor, but in the tropics it's uh, indoor, outdoor, and in between. So black, white, and gray. Um, that actually fed directly into this project we did in Victoria Park Road, which was um, a very tight site with the architecture. And we we're looking at borrowed landscape and how basically a grid could go across the boundary. So you um, had a dialogue between these closely packed houses. Um, but also then thinking about, oh, maybe this matrix of spaces is just indoor, outdoor, and in between. Um, and I mean, this is one of the houses, but I think you can see how that idea of the painting um, creates this idea of a three-dimensional matrix. Um, it ran through in the way we organized the project, uh, even in terms of the sort of colors that we quite consciously uh, have a, a little bit um, sort of black, white, and gray. Uh, and then in terms of the light quality and the way garden and landscape also become sort of squares in the, in the chessboard. Another one is Stadium Station, um, which I think this is such an old presentation, the building wasn't finished uh, that photo came from. Uh, but that one we were thinking, how do we, you know, it was, it was quite an interesting project where we had to deal with the big crowds from the National Stadium. So we didn't want to force everybody underground. So it's one of the few stations in Singapore with a ground level concourse. And then this idea of how we would bring people into the ground. And I've always enjoyed these artworks of Richard Serra, which is the artwork at the top, where there's this massive plates of stainless, of um, uh, Corten rusted steel that you walk between. And they have this very geological quality. So uh, the artwork sort of triggered the idea of the geology and the canyon and the idea that you could go, um, it, the shape sort of squashed you down. It would be a very nice way to descend into the earth. Um, then in terms of the, the actual building, because we are not, we're building a building that's much more complicated than a sculpture in terms of our function and all kinds of aspects. Um, and so thinking about how to deal with these facades that we wanted them to have a sort of geological quality, but also be quite light. Um, this is a, a, a piece of art by a Dutch artist called Jan Schoenhoven, uh, who was part of this zero group in, um, in the Netherlands, which was trying to reduce art down to the basics. Uh, but it's very useful for architects because <laughs> I think it's uh, once things reach a certain level of abstraction, they become quite architectural. Uh, and so this was, this is really about, um, it's really the, uh, the differences that make it interesting, this, um, this grid. You know, so it's the faint variation, it's the missing parts, uh, it's the, um, this sort of pleasure of understanding a system and then enjoying the variation within it. Um, at the same time, it really reminded me of uh, many local sort of textiles and, and materials. So uh, about uh, weaving and uh, or like bamboo blinds and that sort of thing. So we developed a, a louver that has these striations on it. Um, and so the, the top one is, is our concept um, design. The bottom one is the actual uh, louvers. Uh, and just this idea that if we just made subtle variation in the height of the striations, it would be something that created that interesting combination of, of repetition and, and difference. Um, and um, actually it's just one louver because extrusions are expensive. So the idea is, uh, you extrude one type of thing, but you can apply it um, uh, upside down, back to front. Uh, and that, because the variations are different, they don't line up and that's where you get the interest. Uh, so this is the actual uh, station where you can see, it does something very interesting, the striations, it changes it from the kind of uh, hard 
shiny surface of aluminium into something that's almost soft like a textile or like a bamboo blind or also like um, sedimentation in rocks. What's also interesting, let me see if I can get this to work. Uh, and this is one of those serendipitous things that I think in terms of people who are in research and stuff. So when you're just playing, I was there recently in the rain. And sorry, it's a terrible image, but um, I think if you can see through the zoom resolution, the striations do really interesting things to the way water collects together and runs down the building. So it actually gathers the water into chunks that move down as separate objects. And that's not something I can use. It's not, it's a bit out of my field of architecture, but I thought it's something in material science or, you know, maybe there's some use for that. Um, and so um, I, I'm, I haven't communicated it to anybody, but anyone there finds it interesting. Uh, but I thought it was, it, there's something there about surfaces and um, surface tension and, 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 you know, is it a quality of the, of the rhythm that we did or the uneven nature of the striations that causes this effect. Um, this one is, did I miss this line? No. It's a, this is Piranesi. So he's, uh, he actually inspired Escher, if you remember the staircase at the beginning. Uh, so doing engravings in um, uh, the late 1700s. Uh, but this is fantasy architecture uh, that he did a series of prisons of the mind. So interesting that these sort of crazy spaces were actually spaces of incarceration. Uh, but they really, I think, have a big um, cultural impact on uh, sort of the possibilities of, of engineering and architecture and this sort of a heroic, uh, almost sacred space that you get. Um, and his thing, there's sort of nonsense. There's like crazy drawbridges and towers and the architecture goes forever. Uh, there's no sort of relief from being inside it, uh, but it's, it's actually quite uh, an amazing space. And, and that kind of atmosphere we thought is interesting for sort of really big buildings the way it's like an indoor city and a sort of matrix of space that goes forever. Uh, and it will also inform when we did our brass buser station, we had a lot of structural bracing, which takes the loads through the station. And I think from Pyrenees, he sort of this idea that um, a journey through heroic bits of structure uh, can be quite an amazing experience. Uh, so we applied it uh, here where you actually on the escalators, we, we spaced the escalators so you actually plunge down into the earth uh, between the structures uh, and thought that this um, sort of heroic environment with light streaming in through the water would be something uh, quite amazing. Uh, so I think in so these cases, it's like art gives you an, a kind of uh, atmosphere that you want to create through your architecture. Uh, and then although it's, a, you know, 300 years later and uh, a very different kind of building, um, the cultural idea propagates uh, through time uh, and can be expressed in a new way. This is another um, drawing by uh, M.C. Escher. In this case, it's not a fantasy um, uh, space, but from one of his trips to Italy. Uh, so this is actually a real place with some artistic exaggeration. And I've actually forgotten about it until um, I was I was doing a sort of a, a talk about the influence of Escher on our work, work and then realized that really uh, Pat Royal on Pickering um, is, is uh, almost directly um, this combination of a sort of a, uh, a contour map uh, um, topography with quite clean architectural forms sitting on top. Okay, the next bit I'll show just a bit, this is a little bit um, uh, less interesting as images. I'm just putting together a lot of covers of books I'm reading at the moment or recently or from even my childhood. So um, this was one of the books from my childhood. Uh, Martin Gardner was a writer in Scientific American who came up with different um, interesting sort of popular culture articles on mathematics. And uh, when I was, Young, my brother and I, like down at our uh, summer holiday, we would 
swap these books around and try out the different things. So uh, recreational mathematics. Uh, that sort of followed on into this, this book, uh, which was really huge in the um, late 70s. I think it, it won a Pulitzer Prize. Um, in many ways, I think the ideas in it are wrong, but it was really interesting that it took um, um, Gödel with his incompleteness theory, uh, Escher, who was dealing with sort of um, interesting uh, artifacts of the visual system and perspective uh, and uh, infinity in sort of within a drawing. And then Bach, who was working with um, very precise harmonic systems and, and aspects like canons and uh, um, where the music folds back on itself and self-references and self-harmonizes. Um, so a really interesting book about uh, cross-disciplinary uh, ideas, uh, translational research, you would probably call it now, uh, or, and just, but just playing with it basically, like it doesn't, um, uh, it doesn't really do anything except delight in making so many connections and then speculating where it might go. And I think in many ways, the attitude that really uh, informs design is, is that kind of uh, connection and speculation. This guy I've got into lately, Gregory Bateson, again from the 70s. So the 70s were a big cross-disciplinary time and it was when um, fields such as ecology were born, when people became aware of uh, that nature was a system, uh, seeing the earth from space. Uh, and there's a lot of thinking and work here I think that we need to go back to because this was really where the birth of sustainability and thinking about um, our, our planet as a, as a limited um, resource and a limited system. But Gregory Bateson is super interesting because he was a mathematician, he was into cybernetics, uh, he wrote a book on schizophrenia, uh, he developed many ideas about ecology, uh, and interestingly, trying to position um, humans and um, our social systems, the way our brain thinks, into uh, ecology and biology. He was married to Margaret Mead, who's a very famous anthropologist, and they did a lot of work in Bali and Papua New Guinea. And so this is one of those weird things where the sort of general things I'm interested in have lately all started to coalesce and converge. Uh, again, very much in the way of a conspiracy theory where you keep thinking there must be meaning in it. Um, so I'm sort of at the moment developing my own nutty theory of everything. Um, but really interesting because at the same time, um, I collect art and I've been, I met an old Dutch guy who used to live in Singapore who had been collecting old Balinese paintings. So I ended up buying some from him and they actually belonged, it turned out, to uh, Margaret Mead and Gregory Bateson. So I have a sort of direct uh, connection to them through interest in art and science <laughs> that I actually really like the, science, the art that they collected and uh, I, I now own it. So I think that, that's something very interesting and cool. Um, Pattern Language is a book by Christopher Alexander, also from the 70s, uh, when they were interested in modular systems and thinking about basically the way we understand and learn and um, about buildings and the way we use them. Uh, and to me now it's something very interesting to go back to it, not so much at the, um, uh, at the building level, but more at the um, urban level and to think about patterns. Um, yet another thing, the tribal art. So I love this book. Then it turns out uh, Edmund Carpenter was a student of Gregory Bateson um, and the title of the book, Patterns That Connect, is Gregory Bateson's famous quote um, about, uh, oh, which I now can't remember. I get rid of It's what is the pattern that connect? Oh, no, I've got to get it. I'll, uh, I'll type it in the notes at the end. It's a, a really interesting uh, sort of summarizing up his way of connecting many things. Um, this guy is also very interesting looking at um, art. Uh, as an anthropological theory. Uh, so he, rather than um, putting on his Western blinkers, he's, as an as a anthropologist, he thought he would look at what art does in Western society and see what it was and, and drew the conclusion that it, it's, um, uh, it's very much a, 
a social activity where um, social values are communicated um, and status is communicated. So uh, useful, I think, for people who are not sure what the value of art is to look at it through this lens. Another book by uh, Gregory Bateson. So, you know, saying that we, we are part of nature and we are part of systems. So our, our, our brain can be looked at through the lens of ecological thinking. Um, then some really interesting books from the 70s, the Tower of Physics uh, was where quantum physics, um, many aspects of it seem really quite kooky and strange, but then uh, looked at through the lens of Eastern mysticism. Um, there were many parallels about uh, what was being said about how, you know, um, the solidity of our everyday life is an illusion and everything is connected. Uh, and this book was interesting. And he's gone on to write this book, System Two of Life, um, which is uh, a great book. I recommend to anyone uh, who, in any field really to see it, because I think it's, um, um, looks at how through the lens of systems, um, we are all interconnected and our knowledge systems need to help us get to a level where we're not destroying everything. So he sort of moved from being quite um, interested in 70s, the sort of 70s common interest in mysticism, I think uh, informed a lot of research into uh, physics, ecology, all these things. And now he has a very um, convincing and meaningful book. For me, uh, so this interest in, in, in art, uh, from about 2000, I, I got interested in tiling. Tiling is something that architects, we have to do all the time. If you remember the MRT station um, with the panels, you know, we're always having to divide floors into tiles, facades into facade panels. So it's something we do all the time. And it can get quite irritating sometimes that there's not that many ways of doing it. Uh, these are the 17 traditional um, uh, tiling uh, groups. Uh, so most tilings you'll see are some form of uh, this. The shapes may change, but the relationship, the, um, uh, the geome ge geometric relationships and topology is the same. Uh, but this was the interesting one in 1970s, Sir Roger Penrose. Uh, who recently got the Nobel Prize for his research on the mathematics uh, that uh, supported black holes. Uh, he was also someone who liked playing and, and geometry. Uh, and he, he developed this, the Penrose tiling, which is an aperiodic tiling. Uh, so I thought it was interesting to work on it and see what could be done to, because um, uh, this is basically new tiles that, it, that um, break out of the box of the 17 types of, of tiling. Uh, and so I did an exhibition um, along with an Escher exhibition in, in 2016 um, of these uh, tessellations, which are basically decorative tilings that are based on uh, new mathematics. Uh, and these, this is some of the, uh, the works. I did display them, if you remember my dad's pollen, uh, <laughs> Pollen photography, this was the one that really reminded me of sort of that what I was coming up with was something. So uh, also made me think of Gregory Bateson and the ecology of mind that maybe my, my father and I are attracted to sort of similar shapes <laughs> from a biological point of view. Um, this is another kind of a, a complex self-similar tiling that's aperiodic. Um, and so these were real like puzzles to me to figure out how to, what were the matching rules, uh, and then how to make them into uh, tessellations. And you get very interesting um, uh, things that never repeat exactly. So they have a, a consistency, but they also have a almost natural feeling um, distribution. Uh, so this is, um, so actually some of my work uh, has actually ended up in, this is an exhibition in, in Lisbon. Uh, so there's, there's a small and strange group of people who like tessellations, <laughs> who enjoy what I do. This is uh, another a fractal um, uh, Siopinski's gasket. 
this is not the same thing, but uh, interestingly, there's another crazy lady in the back of Tasmania who develops tiles. So this is a tiling that she developed. It's really interesting. Uh, and then I actually worked out the method in which you can generate the tiling. Um, she had a much more complicated method. And then for no reason, really, I turned it into turtles and uh, turtles and lizards. Um, and then figuring out a design where you can still pick up that really interesting fractal structure. Um, despite the fact there's only um, two tiles in it, uh, you get this infinite pattern that goes for, um, you know, Am I talking too long? <laughs> um, just some other other ones. Sorry, Richard. There was uh, just an issue with the mic. Um, so so okay. we missed the last sentence. Apologies. How long, am I droning on too long? Oh. <laughs> uh, these are just sort of other examples. So I'm, I'm very interested from an architectural point of view, which this research sort of starts feeding into. Can I make things that are very interesting and complex, but they don't need a lot of manufacture. So, you know, this only requires um, four tiles to create such a pattern. Other ones was about, um, this I thought was really interesting. It's a bird made of birds and this idea of self-referential um, uh, elements. Uh, so I, de I developed a set of these things that I called um, fixels. So they're fish pixels and uh, I can actually, by putting them together, um, create fish out of fish. <laughs> uh, and so the, you sort of get an interesting thing where this is two levels of self-reference, you know, so the fish make bigger fish. These could then be assembled into an enormous fish uh, out of those second level fish. Uh, similarly, this is uh, a tiling that I, I developed. And I thought oh, I could kind of see like shapes of, uh, butterflies and birds and things in there. Uh, so developed um, a set of, of designs that um, assemble into these, these creatures. And so uh, end up having, you know, big butterflies that are made of smaller butterflies, birds and bats. Um, so it's from an installation in a, in a hotel in, in Jakarta. Uh, and also really like sort of the dialogue between Batik since it's a the client who who owns this hotel is a collector of batik so this is that sort of um uh making more and more connections i think makes things interesting so the artwork itself almost becomes a cabinet of curiosities it contains ideas about mathematics that it contains ideas about culture and textiles uh also about um uh, nature this was something i did for art science museum recently uh, where they did a exhibition about um, Marvel, uh, Marvel comics and, uh, and their movies. Uh, so they asked me to produce an artwork that was related to Doctor Strange. Uh, and it's just a super geometric movie uh, and uses all this sort of uh, fractal sets. Um, so I thought it'd be interesting to take that image you saw at the beginning, fractal relativity. Um, and because Escher did these perspectives and he also did tiling, but he never did a tiled perspective. Uh, and so I thought oh, I could actually transform that space into a, into a tiling um, and then uh, assemble them together to create a kind of architectural space. And then through making it a fractal tiling, you know, this space would actually sort of be this quite amazing um, space that refracts and uh, gets smaller and smaller and goes, if it kept going, it could go to infinity. Um, at the same time, I was really interested from a sort of art point of view with this axonometric projection of space. So it's not perspective. Um, and it's a very Asian um, way of representing space too. So if you think of traditional Japanese or Chinese uh, paintings, they will typically use um, axonometric projection and also use this sort of diminishing uh, scale to, um, to uh, represent distance rather than Western optical perspective. Uh, so that's the, the artwork uh, in Taiwan. 
If any of you are interested, there's a little book on all these um, complex tessellations, which uh, uh, you can get from books actually in Singapore. So then I'm just going to go through some designs. So from making these patterns and sort of finding them um, appealing to my brain, I thought it'd be interesting to make carpets with them. Uh, and so then you get into the interesting thing of like translating something that's quite an abstract idea into uh, technology. Uh, and so this is uh, just the process, for instance, of, of transferring a pattern into a carpet. In, with a carpet, you then have to deal with things like the, the pixels are actually the, um, the knots in the carpet or the tuft. Uh, and so there's a, there's a level of practicality as to sort of what scale of um, image, what resolution you can get into a carpet. Uh, and then working with um, the effects you can get from like cut and loop and the way it's put together. So this is where they transfer the pattern to the backing. Uh, they then work with a gun to, to punch in the, so each pixel is a, is, is a knot. Um, and this is the, the design of the carpet. And then the, the actual, uh, actual carpet and uh, and then sort of interestingly through my challenges with the, the pattern. So this is a aperiodic pattern. So the edge wasn't regular. Uh, so you get a, a kind of um, that interesting shape on the edge, which is also like my dad's pollen pictures. <laughs> uh, but then it sort of becomes an aesthetic that as an architect, you can use this and think, okay, this is a, a different way of defining a shape. It's sort of a fresh, um, it's a fresh edge. You know, maybe this could be uh, design of a swimming pool or it could be the um, where a lawn meets the um, the natural environment that sort of thing so I do find it interesting that sort of working through different scales and different elements can can guide your hand or the computer in terms of the shapes you make coming up these are some textiles that were also developed on the tiling system uh, that we incorporated into into our um, furniture design um, based on the same system was playing with 3D printing with making uh, screens that have a single, um, a single element that repeats and can be put together in different ways to create a complex uh, spatial element. Um, this ended up being very simplified a version of it. And then we used it in our um, Chengi Airport Crown Plaza as a, as a wall panel. Uh, another version of, of the screen. So I was very interested in like, can I make one object that by orientating it in different ways can create um, a periodic or complex pattern. So this is a single, could be a concrete block uh, that makes a, a screen with a, a pattern that goes uh, forever. Uh, a different version that we did in Mumbai on a project. Uh, so looking at, um, ideas of sort of Mergle gardens, abstract patterns, uh, complex um, space filling curves, uh, and, and then make, combining that with a traditional Jali. Uh, another rug. Another rug, then this is the sort of a, a tiling pattern, which is also that thing about figure and ground um, repetition. Uh, a different version that we made as a cement uh, block, which you can see in Punch Cafe in North Canal Road. That idea of a continuous curve, thinking, oh, it'd be nice if that curve was a, was a, a creeper or a plant. Uh, so develop this design for uh, a screen. Um, so again, right back to that MRT station with the single panel that could be reversed and put around. This is a a single panel that has a front and a back that you see through to each other. Um, and so developed it as a system and then used it as a, as a cladding for a pavilion. Other aspects like drawing um, can, as I was saying, the drawing, the process of drawing something. So this is a sort of abstracted figure from a life drawing class, uh, but through that process of simplifying the figure into forms. Uh, and around the same time, we were doing a scheme for, actually Gardens by the Bay, uh, 
not guns, by the way. Um, well, next to guns, by the way, the um, casino. Uh, we were in a team for a brief period and realized that this, the sort of the merging together these various conference rooms and things became like putting together a body and it was somehow very similar, uh, the expression. Uh, another drawing of mine at the same time was doing the Crown Plaza Changi Airport. So um, that part you can see up there, it was like a way of um, negotiating the form of the body. In the Crown Plaza, we had this very difficult site where we were building on an existing car park and we had all sorts of things we had to shape the public space around. And I just, you know, it's naturally my pen formed the same shape that I've been drawing a lot on the drawings. Uh, and so it's a, it's quite a sensuous building that I think you sort of feel this aspect of, can almost feel the pen drawing around uh, all the different levels. So it's sort of like a exploded drawing uh, that draws the way you move through the space. And that textile inspiration, uh, the, the facade is like a, a kind of three-dimensional textile. And a, another version of an aperiodic tiling, which um, we developed into a facade in, in, in China. And in many ways, I mean, this is like a little bit um, indulgent. You know, the client didn't ask for a aperiodic facade, uh, <laughs> but um, it was a, one of those things drawing connections. You know, there's the um, Chinese joinery in terms of doing fretwork or, or shelving which reminded me of this sort of pattern. And so I think when visitors go there, they just think it's an interesting Chinese inspired screen. Uh, as an architect, I like it because it's not really repetitive. Like there's a, a big structure that runs through it so that the fractal scalar quality actually really works for a building that looks good close up and far away. And so the last one, I think last section, I should finish soon. Uh, so that pattern language book, as I mentioned before, um, and the systems view of life, there's something that in the last few years has been quite influential. Uh, we wrote a book called Garden City Megacity, uh, but it, it's actually kind of a pattern book for sustainable cities. Uh, and so all these strategies that you see here are patterns that we use in our projects and that repeat because they're successful and they achieve the kind of uh, outcomes that we want. Uh, and so just showing you the last few slides, how those patterns uh, apply. Um, and so this project, Skyville at Dawson, uh, is a public housing project. Um, we actually like the idea of making it into villages. So a village is a social construct, but it's also about a sort of a limited number of homes that belong to one um, place or one spatial dimension. Uh, we had to provide 960 homes so we thought how do we do that in a way where you feel more like part of a smaller component um, and so we came up with this simple idea of um, stacking up villages but now you've seen all my explanation of, of tiling and modules and the way things go together you can see this is actually a kind of three-dimensional tessellation of um, villages so each village is a, is a tile in a way and they 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 tile to fill space um, so vertically, you can see also the, the way they, they repeat. Um, so that idea of um, uh, repetition and difference. So each one, each floor as you go up has differences to it, but it's also got many um, repeated elements. So you'll see here, for instance, where the balconies are, uh, are different. And in fact, on different floor plans, um, the public space flips from one side to the other, so you get different combinations of the of the three um, of the th of the two orientations in the three blocks. Uh, so, in some ways, you might think it would be very rigid and unpleasant from being derived from this sort of idea of repetition and difference. Uh, but just like that Dutch drawing at the beginning, like it's the small differences and it's the things that interrupt the grid that make it interesting. So when you combine it with nature, when you combine it with the human elements of, of the way people operate, the repetition actually becomes a sort of beautiful framework or grid for supporting life. 
And so here, for instance, is an example, the, at the ground level, the, this area is the um, sort of reception for the whole block and where the letterboxes are. You've got the park outside. Uh, when you go up, it's in the sky and it's a, it's a village. It's actually the same sort of space, but it has differences in the way it's put together. Uh, and then I think this is my last image. Um, when you also repeat things, so if you remember the Pyrenees, the prison with this sort of heroic space, they're sometimes quite banal things, you know, like walkways and, and, um, and, and walls. And here we have drying courts and air conditioning ledges. But when they're assembled in such a way that you are in a heroic space, I think it also creates a very nice um, dialogue between these two things. So it's sort of your, your ordinary life in public housing is also an inspiring and awesome uh, space that um, uh, can operate sort of at the same time, uh, but both operate independently as well. So, you know, you're in a cozy home. It's a nice place, you know, your neighbors. You're also in an amazing, um, sort of space age cathedral. Uh, and both these things can be true at the same time. So that, that's the end of my, my uh, presentation, Lucien. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, uh, Richard. So, uh, the difficulty you always hear is normally you would hear clapping from a lot of people. Fortunately, uh, that's not, uh, not possible. Um, but Richard, thank you very much uh, for Share, share with us a bit about your life and what, what's inspired you, the things that you've learned uh, through your parents um, and what you, that you have picked up. And they, there seem to be a pattern. It's all about patterns. Patterns in your life. Things come back and, and start getting uh, uh, linked, which I thought was uh, very interesting uh, to see. Um, also, the inspirations behind various designs, because when we see a building, we see a building or a product or it doesn't matter what, you know, an artificial object. And we think, OK, someone decided that that was when I look now out of my window, that's gray and that's white and that has a corner. But we don't always know what inspired it. And, uh, I know that uh, I see quite a lot of people with architecture uh, backgrounds here, and um, I also know for things where you have been involved in design process, you know how certain things have inspired certain shapes. And actually, I always find it it gives life to these objects. You you understand it better. Uh, so thank you for for sharing that. I'm sure we will look differently. Uh, on some of the places that you've designed uh, here in or by, by knowing that. Um, so I would like to invite everyone, use, uh, please use the chat uh, if you want to ask questions um, uh, to Richard. And uh, while we are awaiting that, um, I just wanted to um, ask you a little bit about something that came up uh, several times. Um, there is this regularity patterns yet they might be boring and put this little a tweak to it yeah but it's an overall irregularity or something do you think it's human nature to want some type of regularity recognizability in life but we also want these little peaks of excitement or things that draw us in or how, how would you see that yeah, I, well, I do think that is, um, is, is something very human. Um, I think uh, we, you know, if you put on your evolutionary hat, I think we, we evolved to be in uh, nature. Um, and I think nature has a lot of that um, quality, you know, a, a forest from a certain distance, the forest looks all the same, you know, it's a lot of trees, but up close, there's infinite variety within the system, you know, so you're not expecting to find, um, you know, a giant orange pile of jelly in the forest. You're expecting to see all different kinds of trees and rocks and animals and things. So, you know, you're, you're, you're um, I think we're, and then I think we're really um, trained to pick up differences, you know. So against the background of the leaves, the deer, 
runs across the scene and our eyes laser focus on the deer, you know, because that's, that's dinner and that's, that's where the difference is happening. Everything else is pretty much the same. So I do think there's, we sort of want to, to be calm and relaxed in our environment. We need to understand it as a visual system that allows us to focus on what we want to do. Um, but we don't want it so boring that it's um, not giving us any stimulus. Yeah. So I think it's, it's, it is something inherently wired across um, almost everybody to, to enjoy this kind of environment. I see a, a question there uh, from uh, Viviana. Thanks very much for your presentation, very inspiring. Um, as you've showed your interest in anthropology, art, biology, among others, into architecture, how is it for you to communicate your point of view to people who are solely focused on monetary gain? and on keeping an unsustainable economic system such as capitalism. Okay, that's <laughs> a, a bit more political, the last thing, but how, how would you? Um, no, I think it's a, it's a, it's a good question. Um, and uh, I probably will get political in answering it. Um, I, I, what we have found, because in our projects, in fact, none of them, like even HDB didn't ask to create villages. That was an idea from us. In Park Royal, for instance, the client didn't ask for gardens. Um, what we found is if you can find a way to enrich the project and bring in more aspects, uh, but in such a way that you're not asking them to pay more for it. In fact, everyone wants to be the good guy. I think most people have would love to um, hear that they had created you know, villages where people know more of their neighbours, which is what's happened in Skyville. Um, if you tell them to create villages, it's going to cost you 20% more. They'll probably say, no, that doesn't work with my financial feasibility. But if you say maybe it's like 1% or 2% more or the same cost, and you give them an opportunity to be generous and to improve the status quo, almost anyone takes it, we've realised. I and I would have said everyone, I think this is where it gets political. I mean, Donald Trump's the first person I've seen, I think, who is so uncurious and who has such a simple view of life, the zero sum game, and isn't sort of interested in, um, uh, in improving things or the commons. But I think apart from him and a few sociopaths, I think almost everybody would love to do the right thing and be applauded for doing the right thing. And it's, I think it's one of the jobs of designers to try and find a path for that to happen because it's, um, it's only through design that you can sort of reach this synthesis of maybe the core project objectives together with a whole lot of beneficial uh, secondary objectives. Mm -hmm. um, are you here? Also an interesting question uh, again, uh, from Sungo. Thank you for great presentation. Loved officials. In the past, there might have been symbolism or meaning attached to patterns used in architecture. I think you also showed some patterns that had that, uh, that meaning. In current times, do you think a lot of meaning is still attached to the use of these patterns? Um, and I think as a separate question, which is an interesting one, I also noted that down. Do we see AI doing the job of creating and designing with patterns or maybe even inventing patterns? So two uh, questions, maybe start yeah. with the first one about the patterns and meaning. So patterns and meaning, yeah, I think that's something that um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cultural loss, I think, currently where, for instance, you know, the batiks I was showing from Indonesia um, to someone maybe 50 years ago, they would know which pattern meant what, and for instance, which um, region of Indonesia it was popular. Maybe it was uh, attached to one of the royal houses, um, like the Kraton in Solo had certain batik patterns that only the royal family could use. Um, and they have meaning like, crisp pattern or you know the sword or the rice or and so many kind of um uh, a, a layer of symbology and cultural meaning behind them i think as we've globalized um a lot of this attachment has been lost even in western culture you know the meaning of flowers for instance was very 
commonly understood during the Victorian period. If you sent somebody lilies versus roses versus daisies, they all had a meaning attached to them and people would understand what, what sending the flowers meant. Um, but I think at the same time, we've, we've, we've got this amazingly um, sort of rich visual resource now where you can draw on so many images. And I think at the same time, we're creating new meanings as we, as we use patterns. Um, and, and so I, I don't think it's, um, I think we've lost uh, maybe the universal sense of what patterns mean, but we've gained possibilities of making new meanings and having uh, new patterns. And one of the reasons I like sort of the, the geometry I was using, the, the, the strange creatures as I called them, was that they're, they're, they're sort of meaning light at the moment. They haven't had a lot of meanings attached to them, like a Penrose tiling doesn't mean anything much it might mean it might sort of signify an interest in uh science or mathematics you know it might brand you as a nerd if you're <laughs> interested in penrose tiling but i quite like the way they are sort of uh they haven't been used for three thousand years and so they they are sort of available for fresh meaning to attach to them um and for the ai i think definitely um there's all sorts of really interesting work being done on, um, I think Google did that horrible dreaming thing, you know, where everything became dogs and eyes. Uh, have you seen that, Lucien? I haven't. It's, it's, really to look into. it's the most creepy thing you've ever seen. It's sort of like the whole world just becomes dogs. It like looks at images and looks for the shapes and converts them to dogs. Uh, oh. if you search for it afterwards. It's like a nightmare, but really interesting, I think, because they're, they're sort of, um, uh, it's an interaction between AI and our visual system. And it's, it's doing it without applying meaning, but we can't stop applying meaning to it. And it, it's quite a horrifying alien meaning <laughs> or sort of intelligence that you get out of these images. Maybe it missed a bit the meaning uh, behind it. <laughs> <laughs> I think what it shows is we'll always attach meaning to things. Um, yeah. and, um, and so as the sort of our human brain, the way we always use metaphor and we always use similarity and we're always searching for patterns, you know, whether it's mm. pat cognitive patterns or visual patterns or symbolic patterns, we're just, uh, you know, our, our eyes and our brains are just mapping the environment the whole time and what we see and testing out these um, ordering systems or, or sim symbolic systems against what we're seeing. So it's, it's, it's good fun, I think. <laughs> Yeah, Ifana, she asked whether the tessellation strategy seems very much in line with BCA's B-score and construction productivity initiatives through DFMA and prefabrication. Very applicable to Singapore context. But she also she hopes we don't turn into a Legoland, though. <laughs> Your comment on that. <laughs> yes, I think it's a valid comment. I mean, it is, it, that thing about um, at what point is, is repetition um, incredibly constraining and restrictive mm. feeling? Uh, and many attempts at prefabrication have ended up with that result, I think. So, you know, in the 70s, it did come in in a big way and then everyone hated it and it was avoided. I think this time around, um, there's sort of new experimentation in it. And of course, there's now with additive manufacturing, you know, there's the the possibility that um, although something may be made out of components, maybe every single component is different because of the way they were manufactured. Uh, so, but I think it's, I think it's where art is useful, you know, because art gives you a way of dispassionately looking maybe at a grid and the Jan Schoenhoven drawing maybe the two things and saying, I find that pleasing and I find that not pleasing. Why is that? Uh, and then you can take that knowledge and apply it to the field of design uh, to, to achieve a, the same kind of reaction. But art, in a way, you know, is faster and purer. So it's a good research um, uh, resource, I think, for, for um, pure research in a way, sort of that, that surfs across uh, many fields of uh, human knowledge. 
Can I ask you a question on the, uh, you know, the Oasia, that large building with all the greenery? Um, that's not very easy in maintenance, is it? If we look at buildings and maintenance. Um, so a bit come back to the earlier question. Um, I'm sure they didn't ask for that because it's very unique. Uh, the client didn't ask for it, but how did you convince them? How, because it's not like, okay, once it's there, it's there. This is a living thing, if you can call it like that. How, how did that process go? How did you, <laughs> to go for something so different i think again well so every architectural project is is unique in its own way sure um, yeah, yeah. and uh so it's hard to sort of draw lessons out of it maybe and this one was a <laughs> very interesting combination that we came up with the initial concept um the then the the person in charge um left the company and and it had a series of project managers who didn't stay very long. <laughs> and so um, the radical concept never got watered down because everybody said, oh, what? My predecessor approved this? Okay, let's move on with it. Uh, and so it was actually a case of sort of where discontinuity of leadership enabled quite a radical idea to survive through the process when it may not have, um, if in, you know, in the normal series of events. At the same time, I, I do take exception, I think, to you saying it's difficult to maintain. Um, it's actually, um, you know, the plants are twining plants, so they hold themselves on. Uh, you can get behind it to all the planters, so it's actually very practical to maintain. It wasn't looking good recently because during COVID, the uh, watering system broke down and the workers didn't come back to fix it. So it's been looking a little bit um, bedraggled, I would say. Uh, but even Bedraggle didn't take more maintenance, it just, <laughs> maybe rather than saying it's difficult to maintain, we should say it's a, um, it's a building that changes through time and transforms itself. And, uh, and that was something that we're very aware of when we work with living materials like plants. Uh, and, uh, you know, but it's, it's also, I think it's, it's like a, um, you could say it also was an information system. On the, on the way the building is being maintained. <laughs> you know, so it's sort of like when, the, when it's not well maintained and the leaves drop and we see more red, it's like it's flashing red, like a distress signal. And the, way, the better maintained it is, the greener and softer it becomes and the happier it looks. So you could say it was a building that had a feedback system, uh, a public feedback system uh, informing everybody on uh, the state of its maintenance. <laughs> okay. Good, I'm looking at the time, it's already 10 minutes past five. Um, so I would like to, uh, to close the meeting. Um, uh, so thank you very much, uh, Richard, for inspiring talk. And I hope also that, uh, I know there are several students there and PT students and researchers, um, that you showed that you can be inspired by a lot of different, different people, books that are by now, that, uh, uh, decades old, uh, yet they, they have something in them. And I was very happy to see that you referred to quite a few Dutch people, by the way. There's <laughs> <laughs> Hofstetter or Escher. Um, that, that's just a small thing, um, <laughs> of course. Um, so thank you very much uh, for all of this. And um, as I hope you inspired uh, people, and I would like to thank you very, very much for taking your time uh, to sharing all of this and I hope that I clap for all the other people uh, who are not able to do that. For everyone who attended, I noticed there are people from various countries in the world. I saw uh, Stockholm there and I saw someone from Israel there and so we are very very happy that you found us. Uh, we also hope and I would like to announce that in time we have in this case a Dutch uh, designer, artist, product developer, um, um, Dan Rosengarde, and I hope you, you all get an invitation uh, for that too. I hope that you will all um, uh, participate uh, again in the third of this series. So thanks very much, uh, Richard, and I wish you all, uh, please stay safe and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you very much. Everyone. Thank you, it was a real pleasure.
And right. anyone who is interested, uh, you know, in applying any of my research in a different and interesting way, do do uh, contact me um, mm -hmm. on uh, Instagram. Is probably the easiest. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you've got Thank your you. detail there. Thanks very much, Richard. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Appreciate. It. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone.